Think and Grow Rich is one of the most influential books of all time in pointing the way to personal achievement, to financial independence, and to riches of the spirit beyond measurement in money. There has never been another book like it, nor ever can be. It was inspired by Andrew Carnegie, who disclosed his formula of personal achievement to the author, Napoleon Hill, many years ago. Carnegie not only made himself a multimillionaire, but he made millionaires of more than a score of men to whom he taught his secret. Another 500 wealthy men revealed the source of their riches to Napoleon Hill, who has spent a lifetime of research in bringing their message to people in all walks of life who are willing to give their thoughts, ideas, and organized plans in return for riches. The riches within your grasp cannot always be measured in money. There are great riches in lasting friendships, harmonious family relationships, sympathy and understanding between business associates, an inner harmony which brings peace of mind measurable only in spiritual values. The philosophy of Think and Grow Rich will prepare you to attract and enjoy these higher estates which always have been and always will be denied to all except those who are ready for them. Everyone desires to be rich, but not everyone knows what constitutes enduring riches. And most people believe riches to consist only in material things that money can buy. Now here is a list of the 12 things which constitute real riches. Number one, a positive mental attitude. Observe that it heads the list. And second, sound physical health. And third, harmony in human relations. And fourth, freedom from fear. And fifth, the hope of future achievement. And sixth, the capacity for applied faith. And seven, willingness to share one's blessings with others. Eight, to be engaged in a labor of love. Nine, an open mind on all subjects toward all people. Ten, complete self-discipline. Eleven, wisdom with which to understand people. And twelve, financial security. Observe, if you will, with great benefit, the fact that money comes at the end of the list of the twelve things that make men rich. Be prepared when you begin to put the philosophy of Think and Grow Rich into action for a changed life which will not only ease the trials and stresses of living, but will also prepare you for the accumulation of material riches in abundance. In every chapter of this book, mention has been made of the money-making secret which has made fortunes for hundreds of exceedingly wealthy men whom I have carefully analyzed over a long period of years. If you are ready to put it to use, you will recognize this secret at least once in every chapter. I wish I might feel privileged to tell you how you will know if you are ready, but that would deprive you of much of the benefit you will receive when you make the discovery in your own way. As a final word of preparation, before you begin the first chapter, may I offer one brief suggestion which may provide a clue by which the Carnegie secret may be recognized. It is this. All achievement, all earned riches, have their beginning in an idea. If you are ready for the secret, you already possess one half of it. Therefore, you will readily recognize the other half the moment it reaches your mind. When you begin to think and grow rich, you will observe that riches begin with a state of mind, with definiteness of purpose, with little or no hard work. You and every other person ought to be interested in knowing how to acquire that state of mind which will attract riches. I spent 25 years in research because I too wanted to know how wealthy men became that way. My brother and I had uh, matriculated at Georgetown University Law School intending to become lawyers. We didn't have any money, but I did have ability to write, and I promised that I would uh, write stories about successful men sell them to the magazines and pay our way through. And my first assignment, fortunately, was with Andrew Carnegie in Pittsburgh. He gave me three hours. And when the three hours were over, he said, now, uh, this interview is just beginning. Uh, come on out the house, stay all night. And uh, after dinner, we'll uh, take up the interview again. He kept me there three days and nights. And believe you me, I was more than flattered. I wondered what it was all about. 
He kept talking to me about the need for a new philosophy. He said, we've had many philosophies from the days of Socrates and Plato on down to the days of William James and Emerson, but most of them dealt with the, the moral laws of life. What we need is an economic philosophy for the man of the streets that will enable him to make use of the know-how gained by men like myself over a lifetime of experience. Well, it sounded uh, very nice to me, except for one thing. I didn't know exactly what that word philosophy meant. And finally, at the end of the third day, he, he said, Now look here, I have been talking to you for three days about the need for a new philosophy, and I'm going to ask you a question about it. If I commission you to become the author of this philosophy, give you letters of introduction to men whose uh, experiences you will need in collaboration with yourself, are you willing to put in 20 years of research, because that's how long it will take, paying your own way as you go along without any subsidy from me, yes or no? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there have been many times in my life when I have faced uh, difficult problems and difficult decisions, and I don't think I ever faced one more embarrassing than that. Because when Mr. Carnegie put that proposition to me, I was, my hand was down in my pocket, and I was fiddling with the money that I had there, just about enough to get back to Washington, and if I had to stay at a hotel instead of Mr. Carnegie's house, I wouldn't have had that much. I didn't even know the meaning of the word philosophy. And here, the richest man in the world wanted me to go to work for him for 20 years without pay. <laughs> Wasn't that a situation for you? I started to tell Mr. Carnegie, I, I started to do just exactly what you or the most of us uh, people would have done under the same circumstances. Now, what do you think that was? What would you have done if you would have faced that sort of proposition, going to work for 20 years without any pay for the richest man in the world? Well, yes, that's what I was about to do. <laughs> but something inside of me wouldn't let me open my mouth until I got a hunch that if Mr. Carnegie had kept me there for three days, it must have been for a purpose. That he must have seen something in me that I didn't know was there. Also, that man, a man with, with Mr. Carnegie's reputation for picking men certainly didn't pick me to do a job like that unless he knew I had the ability to do it. And whatever this something was, this silent, invisible person that was standing, looking over my shoulder and whispering in my ear, said, go ahead and tell him yes. I said, Mr. Carnegie, I not only will accept the commission, sir, but you may depend upon it that I will complete it. He said, I like the way you ended that sentence up, and I think you'll do it. You have the job. The only contribution Mr. Carnegie ever made to me outside of introducing me where I need to be introduced was to pay my expenses in the early part of my relationship with him. The first man he sent me to see was Henry Ford. I said, I want you to go up to uh, Detroit, become acquainted with Henry Ford, observe him carefully, because one of these days he's going to dominate the uh, motor industry. And it's going to be second only to the steel industry. This was in 1908, the late fall of 1908, ladies and gentlemen. I went up there and spent two days trying to find Ford, and when I did find him, he came out of the rear of a shop where he'd been doing some experimenting with an old pair of overalls on, a plug hat or a, 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 a derby hat that had been bashed in the crown, the grease all over his hands. I remember he got my shirt sleeves dirty when I shook hands with him. And uh, I sat down for a half hour with Mr. Ford, and about all uh, of his conversation consisted of yes and no, mostly no. And I wondered how a man like Mr. Carnegie could have made a mistake like that. Imagine if Mr. Ford would ever be a leader in anything. <laughs> well, I won't tell you the rest of it. That's enough. Desire. The starting point of all achievement. The first step toward riches. A long while ago, a great warrior faced a situation which made it necessary for him to make a decision which ensured his success on the battlefield. He was about to send his armies against a powerful foe, whose men outnumbered his own. He loaded his soldiers into boats, sailed to the enemy's country, unloaded soldiers and equipment, then gave the order to burn the ships that had carried them. Addressing his men before the first battle, he said, You see the boats going up in smoke. That means that we cannot leave these shores alive unless we win. We now have no choice. We win or we perish. They won. 
Every person who wins in an undertaking must be willing to burn his ships and cut all sources of retreat. Only by so doing can one be sure of maintaining that state of mind known as a burning desire to win, essential to success. Every human being who reaches the age of understanding of the purpose of money wishes for it. Wishing will not bring riches, but desiring riches with a state of mind that becomes an obsession, then planning definite ways and means to acquire riches, and backing those plans with persistence which does not recognize failure, will bring riches. Six Ways to Turn Desires into Gold The method by which desire for riches can be transmuted into its financial equivalent consists of six definite practical steps. That is, first, fix in your mind the exact amount of money you desire. It is not sufficient merely to say, I want plenty of money. Be definite as to the amount. There is a psychological reason for definiteness, which will be described in a subsequent chapter. Second, determine exactly what you intend to give in return for the money you desire. There is no such reality as something for nothing. Third, establish a definite date when you intend to possess the money you desire. Fourth, create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once whether you are ready or not, to put this plan into action. Fifth, write out a clear, concise statement of the amount of money you intend to acquire, name the time limit for its acquisition, state what you intend to give in return for the money, and describe clearly the plan through which you intend to accumulate it. Sixth, read your written statement aloud twice daily, once just before retiring at night, and once after arising in the morning. As you read, See and feel and believe yourself already in possession of the money. It is important that you follow the instruction described in these six steps. It is especially important that you observe and follow the instructions in the sixth paragraph. You may complain that it's impossible for you to see yourself in possession of money before you actually have it. Here is where a burning desire will come to your aid. If you truly desire money so keenly that your desire is an obsession, you will have no difficulty in convincing yourself that you will acquire it. The object is to want money and to become so determined to have it that you convince yourself you will have it. Can you imagine yourself a millionaire? To the uninitiated, who has not been schooled in the working principles of the human mind, these instructions may appear impractical. It may be helpful to all who fail to recognize the soundness of the six steps to know that the information they convey was received from Andrew Carnegie, who began as an ordinary laborer in the steel mills, but managed, despite his humble beginning, to make these principles yield him a fortune of considerably more than one hundred million dollars. It may be a further help to know that the six steps here recommended were carefully scrutinized by the late Thomas A. Edison, who placed his stamp of approval upon them as being not only the steps essential for the accumulation of money, but for the attainment of any goal. The steps call for no hard labor. They call for no sacrifice. They do not require one to become ridiculous or credulous. To apply them calls for no great amount of education. But the successful application of these six steps does call for sufficient imagination to enable one to see and to understand that accumulation of money cannot be left to chance, good fortune, and luck. One must realize that all who have accumulated great fortunes first did a certain amount of dreaming, hoping, wishing, desiring, and planning before they acquired money. You may as well know right here that you can never have riches in great quantity unless you can work yourself into a white heat of desire for money and actually believe you will possess it. If the thing you wish to do is right and you believe in it, go ahead and do it. Put your dream across, and never mind what they say if you meet with temporary defeat, for they, perhaps, do not know that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent success. Thomas Edison dreamed of a lamp that could be operated by electricity began where he stood to put his dream into action, 
And despite more than 10,000 failures, he stood by that dream until he had made it a physical reality. Practical dreamers do not quit. Imagine a man, for instance, standing by through 10,000 different failures, as Mr. Edison did, before giving up. His uh, personal initiative was so definite that he told me that if he hadn't found the secret of the incandescent electric lamp, that at that very moment he would be in the laboratory working on it instead of being out there wasting his time talking with me. And then in a more serious note, Mr. Edison said, uh, You know, I had to succeed because I finally ran out of things that wouldn't work. And I've thought of that so many times, wondering why more people don't keep on keeping on until they run out of things that won't work, for then they're bound to find the thing that will work. There is a difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive it. No one is ready for a thing until he believes he can acquire it. The state of mind must be belief, not mere hope or wish. Open-mindedness is essential for belief. Closed minds do not inspire faith, courage, and belief. Remember, no more effort is required to aim high in life, to demand abundance and prosperity, than is required to accept misery and poverty. I believe in the power of desire backed by faith, because I have seen this power lift men from lowly beginnings to places of power and wealth. I have seen it rob the grave of its victims. I have seen it serve as the medium by which men stage to come back after having been defeated in a hundred different ways. I have seen it provide my own son with a normal, happy, successful life, despite nature's having sent him into the world without ears. When my second son Blair was born, he was born without ears. And the doctors told me that he would be a deaf mute all of his life. I told them he would not be a deaf mute and that he would live to have 100% of his hearing just like other children. And one of these doctors came over and put his arm on my shoulder, and he said, Now look here, Napoleon, there are some things in this world that neither you nor I nor anyone else can do anything about, and now you face one of those situations. I said, Doctor, there is nothing in this world that I can't do something about, if it's nothing more than adjust myself to an unpleasant situation so it does not destroy my spirit. I went to work on that child through prayer before I ever saw him. I worked on him continuously, almost four hours a day for the first four years of his life. And at the age of about 18 months, we recognized that he was beginning to hear. We didn't know just how much. But by the time he had reached the fourth year, he had developed 65% of his normal hearing. And in his third year in college, in the University of West Virginia, the Acoustican Company, manufacturer of hearing aids, heard about this unusual case, the only one of its kind in the world where a child born without ears ever learned to hear came down to the University of West Virginia and made him a special hearing aid that gave him the other 35% of his hearing, and Blair today has 100% of his hearing just exactly like I said he would. It's almost one of the modern miracles of medical science that this thing happened, and the doctors today don't know exactly how it did happen. I'm not so sure that I did, but I know what I was doing to help bring it about. Faith is the head chemist of the mind. When faith is blended with thought, the subconscious mind instantly picks up the vibration, translates it into its spiritual equivalent, and transmits it to infinite intelligence, as in the case of prayer. The emotions of faith, love, and sex are the most powerful of all the major positive emotions. When the three are blended, they have the effect of coloring thought in such a way that it instantly reaches the subconscious mind where it is changed into its spiritual equivalent, the only form that induces a response from infinite intelligence. How to develop faith? There comes now a statement which will give a better understanding of the importance the principle of autosuggestion assumes in the transmutation of desire into its physical or monetary equivalent. Namely, faith is a state of mind which may be induced or created by affirmation or repeated instructions to the subconscious mind through the principle of auto-suggestion. Repetition of affirmation of orders to your subconscious mind is the only known method of voluntary development of the emotion of faith. No one is doomed to bad luck. There are millions of people who believe themselves doomed to poverty and failure because of some strange force over which they believe they have no control. They are the creators of their own misfortunes because of this negative belief. 
which is picked up by the subconscious mind and translated into its physical equivalent. In language which any normal human being can understand, we will describe all that is known about the principle through which faith may be developed where it does not already exist. Have faith in yourself, faith in the infinite. Before we begin, you should be reminded again that faith is the eternal elixir which gives life, power, and action to the impulse of thought. The foregoing sentence is worth reading a second time, and a third, and a fourth. It is worth reading aloud. Faith is the starting point of all accumulation of riches. Faith is the basis of all miracles and all mysteries which cannot be analyzed by the rules of science. Faith is the only known antidote for failure. Faith is the element, the chemical, which when mixed with prayer, gives one direct communication with infinite intelligence. Faith is the element which transforms the ordinary vibration of thought created by the finite mind of man into the spiritual equivalent. Faith is the only agency through which the cosmic force of infinite intelligence can be harnessed and used by man. Thoughts which are mixed with any of the feelings of emotions constitute a magnetic force which attracts other similar or related thoughts. Now let us go back to the starting point and become informed as to how the original seed of an idea, plan, or purpose may be planted in the mind. The information is easily conveyed. Any idea, plan, or purpose may be placed in the mind through repetition of thought. This is why you are asked to write out a statement of your major purpose or definite chief aim, committed to memory, and repeat it in audible words day after day until these vibrations of sound have reached your subconscious mind. Resolve to throw off the influences of any unfortunate environment and to build your own life to order. Taking inventory of mental assets and liabilities, you may discover that your greatest weakness is lack of self-confidence. This handicap can be surmounted and timidity translated into courage through the aid of the principle of auto-suggestion. The application of this principle may be made through a simple arrangement of positive thought impulses stated in writing, memorized, and repeated until they become a part of the working equipment of the subconscious faculty of your mind. Self-confidence formula. First, I know that I have the ability to achieve the object of my definite purpose in life. Therefore, I demand of myself persistent, continuous action toward its attainment, and I here and now promise to render such action. Second, I realize the dominating thoughts of my mind will eventually reproduce themselves in outward physical action and gradually transform themselves into physical reality. Therefore, I will concentrate my thoughts for 30 minutes daily upon the task of thinking of the person I intend to become, thereby creating in my mind a clear mental picture. Third, I know through the principle of auto-suggestion, any desire that I persistently hold in my mind will eventually seek expression through some practical means of attaining the object back of it. Therefore, I will devote ten minutes daily to demanding of myself the development of self-confidence. Fourth, I have clearly written down a description of my definite chief aim in life, and I will never stop trying until I shall have developed sufficient self-confidence for its attainment. Fifth, I fully realize that no wealth or position can long endure unless built upon truth and justice. Therefore, I will engage in no transaction which does not benefit all whom it affects. I will succeed by attracting to myself the forces I wish to use and the cooperation of other people. I will induce others to serve me because of my willingness to serve others. I will eliminate hatred, envy, jealousy, selfishness, and cynicism by developing love for all humanity, because I know that a negative attitude toward others can never bring me success. I will cause others to believe in me because I will believe in them and in myself. I will sign my name to this formula, commit it to memory, and repeat it aloud once a day with full faith that it will gradually influence my thoughts and actions 
so that I will become a self-reliant and successful person. The Disaster of Negative Thinking The subconscious mind makes no distinction between constructive and destructive thought impulses. It works with the material we feed it through our thought impulses. The subconscious mind will translate into reality a thought driven by fear just as readily as it will translate into reality a thought driven by courage or faith. Like the wind which carries one ship east and another west, the law of auto-suggestion will lift you up or pull you down according to the way you set your sails of thought. Auto-suggestion the medium for influencing the subconscious mind, the third step toward riches. Autosuggestion is a term which applies to all suggestions and all self-administered stimuli which reach one's mind through the five senses. Stated in another way, autosuggestion is self-suggestion. It is the agency of communication between that part of the mind where conscious thought takes place and that which serves as the seat of action for the subconscious mind. See and feel money in your hands. You were instructed in the last of the six steps described in the chapter on desire to read aloud twice daily the written statement of your desire for money and to see and feel yourself in possession of the money. By following these instructions, you communicate the object of your desire directly to your subconscious mind in a spirit of absolute faith. Through repetition of this procedure, you voluntarily create thought habits which are favorable to your efforts to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent. Remember, therefore, when reading aloud the statement of your desire, through which you are endeavoring to develop a money consciousness, that the mere reading of the words is of no consequence unless you mix emotion or feeling with your words. Your subconscious mind recognizes and acts only upon thoughts which have been well mixed with emotion or feeling. Plain, unemotional words do not influence the subconscious mind. You will get no appreciable results until you learn to reach your subconscious mind with thoughts or spoken words which have been well emotionalized with belief. Do not become discouraged if you cannot control and direct your emotions the first time you try to do so. Remember, there is no such possibility as something for nothing. You cannot cheat, even if you desire to do so. The price of ability to influence your subconscious mind is everlasting persistence in applying the principles described here. You cannot develop the desired ability for a lower price. You and you alone must decide whether or not the reward for which you are striving, the money consciousness, is worth the price you must pay for it in effort. Your ability to use the principle of auto-suggestion will depend very largely upon your capacity to concentrate upon a given desire until that desire becomes a burning obsession. Please fast forward to the end and turn the tape over for proper cueing of side two. steps to stimulate your subconscious mind. The instructions given in connection with the six steps in the second chapter will now be summarized and blended with the principles covered by this chapter as follows. First, go into some quiet spot, preferably in bed at night, where you will not be disturbed or interrupted. Close your eyes and repeat aloud, so you may hear your own words, the written statement of the amount of money you intend to accumulate the time limit for its accumulation, and a description of the service or merchandise you intend to give in return for the money. As you carry out these instructions, see yourself already in possession of the money. For example, suppose that you intend to accumulate $50,000 by the 1st of January, five years hence, that you intend to give personal services in return for the money in the capacity of a salesman. Your written statement of your purpose should be similar to the following. By the first day of January 19 so-and-so, 
I will have in my possession $50,000, which will come to me in various amounts from time to time during the interim. In return for this money, I will give the most efficient service of which I am capable, rendering the fullest possible quantity and the best possible quality of service in the capacity of salesman of, and here describe the service or merchandise you intend to sell. I believe that I will have this money in my possession. My faith is so strong that I can now see this money before my eyes. I can touch it with my hands. It is now awaiting transfer to me at the time and in the proportion that I deliver the service I intend to render in return for it. I am awaiting a plan by which to accumulate this money, and I will follow that plan when it is received. Second, repeat this program night and morning until you can see in your imagination the money you intend to accumulate. Third, place a written copy of your statement where you can see it night and morning, and read it just before retiring and upon arising until it has been memorized. Remember, as you carry out these instructions, that you are applying the principle of auto-suggestion for the purpose of giving orders to your subconscious mind. Remember also that your subconscious mind will act only upon instructions which are emotionalized and handed over to it with feeling. Faith is the strongest and most productive of the emotions. Follow the instructions given in the chapter on faith. These instructions may at first seem abstract, do not let this disturb you. Follow the instructions, no matter how abstract or impractical they may at first appear to be. The time will soon come if you do as you've been instructed, in spirit as well as in act, when a whole new universe of power will unfold to you. Specialized Knowledge Personal Experiences or Observations The Fourth Step Toward Riches there are two kinds of knowledge. One is general, the other is specialized. General knowledge, no matter how great in quantity or variety it may be, is of but little use in the accumulation of money. The faculties of the great universities possess in the aggregate practically every form of general knowledge known to civilization. Most of the professors have but little money. They specialize on teaching knowledge, but they do not specialize on the organization or the use of knowledge. Knowledge will not attract money unless it is organized and intelligently directed through practical plans of action to the definite end of accumulation of money. Lack of understanding of this fact has been the source of confusion to millions of people who falsely believe that knowledge is power. It is nothing of the sort. Knowledge is only potential power. It becomes power only when and if it is organized into definite plans of action and directed to a definite end. This missing link in all systems of education may be found in the failure of educational institutions to teach their students how to organize and use knowledge after they acquire it. Many people make the mistake of assuming that because Henry Ford had but little schooling, he was not a man of education. Those who make this mistake do not understand the real meaning of the word educate. That word is derived from the Latin word educo, meaning to educe, to draw out, to develop from within. An educated man is not necessarily one which has an abundance of general or specialized knowledge. An educated man is one who has so developed the faculties of his mind that he may acquire anything he wants or its equivalent without violating the rights of others. You must remember that Mr. Edison only had three months of schooling in his entire life. Although he chose a work that called for the application of many of the sciences, he knew nothing about any of them. Now, you may wish to ask, uh, how in the world did he get along with only three months of schooling in the business of inventing, dealing with the sciences, and yet knowing nothing about any of them? I've been asked that question many times. Well, the answer is very simple. He got along by surrounding himself with men who did understand the sciences, technical men, educated men, and uh, he used their brains just as successfully as if he had had the knowledge himself. As a matter of fact, every successful man in the upper brackets of achievement makes use of other people's knowledge and their influence and their education under the mastermind principle. Then there would be uh, Mr. Andrew Carnegie, my sponsor. 
He came over to this country in the steerage, didn't have enough money to pay first-class fare on the boat. And he rose to a high position in the world by surrounding himself with men who knew more than he did, who could do the things that he wanted done. And um, I could name a hundred others who started at, in low positions and rose to high positions in life by associating themselves with their, other people under the mastermind principle. The accumulation of great fortunes calls for power, and power is acquired through highly organized and intelligently directed specialized knowledge. But that knowledge does not necessarily have to be in the possession of the man who accumulates the fortune. The preceding paragraph should give hope and encouragement to the man with ambition to accumulate a fortune who has not possessed himself of the necessary education to supply such specialized knowledge as he may require. Men sometimes go through life suffering from inferiority complexes because they are not men of education. The man who can organize and direct a mastermind group of men who possess knowledge useful in the accumulation of money is just as much a man of education as any man in the group. Back of all ideas is specialized knowledge. Unfortunately, for those who do not find riches in abundance, specialized knowledge is more abundant and more easily acquired than ideas. Because of this very truth, there is a universal demand and an ever-increasing opportunity for the person capable of helping men and women to sell their personal services advantageously. Capability means imagination, the one quality needed to combine specialized knowledge with ideas in the form of organized plans designed to yield riches. If you have imagination, this chapter may present you with an idea sufficient to serve as the beginning of the riches you desire. Remember, the idea is the main thing. Specialized knowledge may be found just around the corner, any corner. Imagination. The Workshop of the Mind. The Fifth Step Toward Riches. The imagination is literally the workshop wherein are fashioned all plans created by man. The impulse, the desire, is given shape, form, and action through the aid of the imaginative faculty of the mind. Two Forms of Imagination The imaginative faculty functions in two forms. One is known as synthetic imagination, and the other as creative imagination. Synthetic imagination. Through this faculty, one may arrange old concepts, ideas, or plans into new combinations. This faculty creates nothing. It merely works with the material of experience, education, and observation with which it is fed. It is the faculty used most by the inventor, with the exception of the genius who draws upon the creative imagination when he cannot solve his problem through synthetic imagination. Creative Imagination Through the faculty of creative imagination, the finite mind of man has direct communication with infinite intelligence. It is the faculty through which hunches and inspirations are received. It is by this faculty that all basic or new ideas are handed over to man. It is through this faculty that one individual may tune in or communicate with the subconscious minds of other men. Center your attention for the time being on the development of the synthetic imagination, because this is the faculty which you will use more often in the process of converting desire into money. Transformation of the intangible impulse of desire into the tangible reality of money calls for the use of a plan or plans. These plans must be formed with the aid of the imagination, and mainly with the synthetic faculty. The Laws That Lead to Fortune The earth on which you live, you yourself, and every other material thing, are the result of evolutionary change through which microscopic bits of matter have been organized and arranged in an orderly fashion. Moreover, and this statement is of stupendous importance, this earth, Every one of the billions of individual cells of your body and every atom of matter began as an intangible form of energy. Desire is thought impulse. Thought impulses are forms of energy. When you begin with a thought impulse, desire to accumulate money, you are drafting into your service the same stuff that nature used in creating this earth and every material form in the universe including the body and brain in which the thought impulses function. If you are one of those who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, perish the thought. It is not true. 
Riches, when they come in huge quantities, are never the result of hard work alone. Riches come, if they come at all, in response to definite demands based upon the application of definite principles and not by chance or luck. Generally speaking, an idea is an impulse of thought that impels action by an appeal to the imagination. All master salesmen know that ideas can be sold where merchandise cannot. Ordinary salesmen do not know this. That is why they are ordinary. There was uh, Clarence Saunders, one of my outstanding students of Memphis, Tennessee. Clarence worked in a grocery store, delivering groceries, more or less. And uh, he had a great amount of enthusiasm and also a keen imagination. He was constantly uh, trying to interest his employer in um, new and improved methods of merchandising. And finally, the employer became so peeved at Clarence for wasting his time with what he called foolish suggestions that he told him that if he came in with another one, he was going to fire him. Shortly thereafter, a cafeteria was opened in Memphis, Tennessee, the first uh, cafeteria that came there. And when Clarence went out to his lunch that day, he saw a great line of people out, extending out onto the sidewalk waiting to be served in the cafeteria. Out of curiosity, he got on the end of the line and... Uh, when he picked up his tray and filled it up, by the time he got down to the cashier or the checker, his imagination began to turn. And he said, what a wonderful thing this would be in our grocery business, to have a self-help uh, grocery store so women could come in with a basket on their arm, pick up what they wanted, and pay for it at one place as they went out. It would save a lot of time, and it would uh, save a lot of uh, embarrassment. Well, Clarence could hardly wait until he got back to the store, and uh, he rushed in and he said, well, Boss, I have a multi-million dollar idea, which I... And the boss said, Now, Clarence, uh, you're fired. Clarence said, Oh, no, I'm not. I resigned before I started to talk. Uh, later on, I talked to the man who, who was Clarence's uh, boss, and he said as near as he could figure, every word that he used in trying to fire Clarence had cost him a million dollars. Because Clarence uh, took his idea of self-help grocery stores to a firm who financed it under the name of Piggly Wiggly Stores, and he made $4 million during the first four years. An astounding illustration of what a man can do with an idea backed by the proper amount of enthusiasm. Organized Planning The Crystallization of Desire into Action The Sixth Step Toward Riches you have learned that everything man creates or acquires begins in the form of desire. That desire is taken on the first lap of its journey from the abstract to the concrete into the workshop of the imagination where plans for its transition are created and organized. You will now be instructed how to build plans which will be practical, namely, A. Ally yourself with a group of as many people as you may need for the creation and carrying out of your plan or plans for the accumulation of money, making use of the mastermind principle described in a later chapter. Compliance with this instruction is absolutely essential. Do not neglect it. B. Before forming your mastermind alliance, Decide what advantages and benefits you may offer the individual members of your group in return for their cooperation. No one will work indefinitely without some form of compensation. No intelligent person will either request or expect another to work without adequate compensation, although this may not always be in the form of money. C. Arrange to meet with the members of your mastermind group at least twice a week, and more often if possible until you have jointly perfected the necessary plan or plans for the accumulation of money. B. Maintain perfect harmony between yourself and every member of your mastermind group. If you fail to carry out this instruction to the letter, you may expect to meet with failure. The mastermind principle cannot obtain where perfect harmony does not prevail. Keep in mind these facts. First, you are engaged in an undertaking of major importance to you. To be sure of success, you must have plans which are faultless. Second, you must have the advantage of the experience, education, native ability, and imagination of other minds. This is in harmony with the methods followed by every person who has accumulated a great fortune. The most intelligent man living cannot succeed in accumulating money, nor in any other undertaking, without plans which are practical and workable. 
Just keep this fact in mind. And remember, when your plans fail, that temporary defeat is not permanent failure. It may only mean that your plans have not been sound. Build other plans. Start all over again. No follower of this philosophy can reasonably expect to accumulate a fortune without experiencing temporary defeat. When defeat comes, accept it as a signal that your plans are not sound. Rebuild those plans and set sail once more toward your coveted goal. If you give up before your goal has been reached, you are a quitter. A quitter never wins, and a winner never quits. Lift this sentence out. Write it on a piece of paper in letters an inch high and place it where you will see it every night before you go to sleep and every morning before you go to work. Take my son Blair, for instance, who was born without any sign of ears. As a result of that adversity, he was trained to believe that it was not an adversity, that it was a blessing because it would cause people to recognize his... Uh, condition and they'd go out of their way to be kind to him and that's exactly the way it turned out. I have often said that my son Blair has uh, made it possible to get through life with less resistance than his other two brothers who have all of their faculties. Adversity. I think I can tell you had it not been for the many adversities which I experienced in the early part of my work with Andrew Carnegie I never would have completed the science of personal achievement. I had uh, adversity after adversity uh, but I learned to transmute those adversities into something constructive and to come up with uh, something that would take the place of an adversity. Every time I failed, I said, well, this is just another opportunity that I have to prove that my philosophy can take care of the situation of failure. I learned to transmute all failures into successes. I also learned the difference between uh, temporary defeat and uh, failure. Most people accept defeat as permanent failure. Uh, defeat is never failure. No circumstance is ever failure until it is accepted by the individual as such. And that's one of the greatest things that I learned about this uh, principle of profiting by adversity. When you begin to select members for your mastermind group, endeavor to select those who do not take defeat seriously. Some people foolishly believe that only money can make money. This is not true. Desire, transmuted into its monetary equivalent through the principles laid down here, is the agency through which money is made. Money of itself is nothing but inert matter. It cannot move, think, or talk. But it can hear when a man who desires it calls it to come. Planning the Sale of Personal Services Intelligent planning is essential for success in any undertaking designed to accumulate riches. Here will be found detailed instructions to those who must begin the accumulation of riches by selling personal services. It should be encouraging to know that practically all the great fortunes began in the form of compensation for personal services or from the sale of ideas. What else except ideas and personal services would one not possessed of property have to give in return for riches? The Major Attributes of Leadership the following are important factors of leadership. 1. Unwavering courage based upon knowledge of self and of one's occupation. No follower wishes to be dominated by a leader who lacks self-confidence and courage. No intelligent follower will be dominated by such a leader very long. 2. Self-control. The man who cannot control himself can never control others. Self-control sets a mighty example for one's followers, which the more intelligent will emulate. 3. A keen sense of justice. Without a sense of fairness and justice, no leader can command and retain the respect of his followers. 4. Definiteness of decision. The man who wavers in his decisions shows that he is not sure of himself, cannot lead others successfully. 5. Definiteness of plans. The successful leader must plan his work and work his plan. A leader who moves by guesswork without practical, definite plans is comparable to a ship without a rudder. Sooner or later he will land on the rocks. 6. The habit of doing more than paid for. One of the penalties of leadership is the necessity of willingness upon the part of the leader to do more than he requires of his followers. 7. A pleasing personality. 
No slovenly, careless person can become a successful leader. Leadership calls for respect. Followers will not respect a leader who does not grade high on all of the factors of a pleasing personality. 8. Sympathy and Understanding The successful leader must be in sympathy with his followers. Moreover, he must understand them and their problems. 9. Mastery of Detail Successful leadership calls for mastery of the details of the leader's position. 10. Willingness to assume full responsibility The successful leader must be willing to assume responsibility for the mistakes and the shortcomings of his followers. If he tries to shift this responsibility, he will not remain the leader. If one of his followers makes a mistake and shows himself incompetent, the leader must consider that it is he who failed. 11. Cooperation. The successful leader must understand and apply the principles of cooperative effort and be able to induce his followers to do the same. Leadership calls for power, and power calls for cooperation. How to get the exact position you desire. Everyone enjoys doing the kind of work for which he is best suited. An artist loves to work with paints, a craftsman with his hands, a writer loves to write. Those with less definite talents have their preferences for certain fields of business and industry. If America does anything well, it offers a full range of occupations, tilling the soil, manufacturing, marketing, and the professions. First, decide exactly what kind of job you want. If the job doesn't already exist, perhaps you can create it. Second, choose the company or individual for whom you wish to work. Third, study your prospective employer as to policies, personnel, chances of advancement. Fourth, by analysis of yourself and your talents and capabilities, figure what you can offer and plan ways and means of giving advantages, services, developments, ideas that you believe you can successfully deliver. Fifth, forget about a job. Forget whether or not there is an opening. Forget the usual routine of, have you got a job for me? Concentrate on what you can give. Sixth, once you have your plan in mind, arrange with an experienced writer to put it on paper in neat form and in full detail. Seventh, present it to the proper person with authority, and he will do the rest. Every company is looking for men who can give something of value, whether it be ideas, services, or connections. Every company has room for the man who has a definite plan of action which is to the advantage of that company. This line of procedure may take a few days or weeks of extra time, but the difference in income, in advancement, and in gaining recognition will save years of hard work at small pay. It has many advantages, the main one being that it will often save from one to five years of time in reaching a chosen goal. Every person who starts or gets in halfway up the ladder does so by deliberate and careful planning. For instance, back in the early days when I wanted to get a job from a certain firm while I was going to high school, here's the way I went about it. I wrote an application stating my qualifications and my desire for the job. Uh, the answer came back, no, too sorry, no position open. Uh, next, I sent a telegram. The answer was still no. And uh, Next, I sent a special delivery letter every day for a week. Answer was still no. Next, I sent a special delivery every hour for two days, and the firm telegraphed me to come and go to work. Every person must be his own salesman of personal services. The quality and the quantity of service rendered, and the spirit in which it is rendered, determine to a large extent the price and the duration of employment. To market personal services effectively, which means a permanent market at a satisfactory price under pleasant conditions, one must adopt and follow the QQS formula, which means that quality plus quantity plus the proper spirit of cooperation equals perfect salesmanship of service. Remember the QQS formula, but do more. Apply it as a habit. Let us analyze the formula to make sure we understand exactly what it means. One. Quality of service shall be construed to mean the performance of every detail in connection with your position in the most efficient manner possible, with the object of greater efficiency always in mind. Two, 
quantity of service shall be understood to mean the habit of rendering all the service of which you are capable at all times with the purpose of increasing the amount of service rendered as greater skill is developed through practice and experience. Emphasis is again placed on the word habit. Three, spirit of service shall be construed to mean the habit of agreeable, harmonious conduct which will induce cooperation from associates and fellow employees. Well, let me relate uh, my experience with Franklin D. Roosevelt in the White House in 1933 and will give you a fine indication of how the students of this philosophy may profit by this important principle. First of all, let me define the principle of going the extra mile. It means rendering more service and better service than you are paid to render, and doing it all the time, and doing it in a pleasing, positive mental attitude. When I went to work for the president in 1933, nothing was said at the beginning about how much I was to receive or who was to pay it. And I had been there about three months when one day Franklin D. Roosevelt asked me who was paying my salary and how much I was getting, and I said, well, Mr. President, uh, that's something I would like to know myself. I haven't heard anything about it. <laughs> and we talked on for a little while, and I said, Well, now, Mr. President, you know, I have been serving you ever since you were Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and particularly while you were, were governor of New York. And you will recall, of course, that up to this time I have never rendered you a bill or asked you to pay me a dollar for my services, and I'm not going to start now. But if you insist upon it, suppose you put me on the payroll at a dollar a year. And that's exactly what he did. Well, I took my typewriter down to the White House, and when I wasn't actually serving the president or some member of his staff or cabinet, I started writing books. I wrote six books that first year, among them Think and Grow Rich, the book that has made me popular all over the world, you might say. I had no intention of publishing that book when I was writing it. I was writing it to myself to keep my mind positive in those uh, days of, of chaos. Well, some three years after I left the service of the president, I got out these manuscripts and read them, and I made up my mind that the only one worth publishing was Think and Grow Rich. And when I took it to my publisher, he said, well, uh, what is in this book that leads you to believe it would sell? I said, you will have to read it to find out. He took it home with him and read it. He had his whole staff read it paragraph by paragraph, and then they took a vote on it, and they voted unanimously that it was the best manuscript that ever came to that publishing house. They printed it, put it to work. And it's been selling as a bestseller all over the world up to this time. It has grossed over 18 millions of dollars and probably will gross many more millions of dollars while I'm still alive. It's been translated into many languages. It was endorsed by Mahatma Gandhi and distributed widely throughout India. It went from there to uh, Brazil where it was translated into the Portuguese language and is widely distributed throughout Latin America. And I think if you'll stop and consider the wages that I asked, the wages that I received of one dollar a year, and the service that I gave for that, you'll recognize what can be accomplished by going the extra mile. Now, let me uh, give you some of the benefits that comes from going the extra mile. Well, it places the law of increasing returns squarely back of one. It brings one to the favorable attention of those who can and do provide opportunities for self-promotion. It tends to permit one to become indispensable in many different human relationships and therefore enables one to command more than average compensation. It leads uh, to a mental growth and physical perfection in various forms of service, thereby developing greater ability and skill in one's uh, chosen vocation. It protects one against the loss of employment and places one in a position to choose his own job and working conditions. It enables one to profit by the law of contrast because the majority of people do not practice the habit of going the extra mile. As a matter of fact, the majority of people don't even go the first mile. And it uh, leads to the development of a positive, pleasing personal attitude, which is among the more important traits of a pleasing personality. And it tends to develop a keen, alert imagination, as it is a habit which keeps one continuously seeking new and more efficient ways of rendering service. It uh, definitely serves to develop uh, self-reliance. It serves also to build uh, the confidence of others in one's integrity. And it is the only logical reason to justify one in asking for a promotion or for more wages, because if a man is not doing any more than he's paid for, then obviously he has no right to ask for more pay.
Do you know your own worth? The oldest of admonitions is, Man, know thyself. If you market merchandise successfully, you must know the merchandise. The same is true in marketing personal services. You should know all of your weaknesses in order that you may either bridge them or eliminate them entirely. You should know your strength in order that you may call attention to it when selling your services. You can know yourself only through accurate analysis. Take inventory of yourself. Annual self-analysis is an essential in the effective marketing of personal services, as is annual inventory in merchandising. Moreover, the yearly analysis should disclose a decrease in faults and an increase in virtues. One goes ahead, stands still, or goes backward in life. One's object should be, of course, to go ahead. Annual self-analysis will disclose whether advancement has been made, and if so, how much. It will also disclose any backward steps one may have made. The effective marketing of personal services requires one to move forward even if the progress is slow. Decision. The Mastery of Procrastination. The Seventh Step Toward Riches. Analysis of over 25,000 men and women who had experienced failure disclosed the fact that lack of decision was near the head of the list of the 31 major causes of failure. Procrastination, the opposite of decision, is a common enemy which practically every man must conquer. Analysis of several hundred people who had accumulated fortunes well beyond the million-dollar mark disclosed the fact that every one of them had the habit of reaching decisions promptly and of changing these decisions slowly if and when they were changed. People who fail to accumulate money without exception have the habit of reaching decisions, if at all, very slowly and of changing these decisions quickly and often. Tips on making your own decisions. The majority of people who fail to accumulate money sufficient for their needs are generally easily influenced by the opinions of others. They permit the newspapers and the gossiping neighbors to do their thinking for them. Opinions are the cheapest commodities on earth. Everyone has a flock of opinions ready to be wished upon anyone who will accept them. Close friends and relatives, while not meaning to do so, often handicap one through opinions, and sometimes through ridicule, which is meant to be humorous. Thousands of men and women carry inferiority complexes with them all through life because some well-meaning but ignorant person destroyed their confidence through opinions or ridicule. You have a brain and a mind of your own. Use it and reach your own decisions. If you need facts or information from other people to enable you to reach decisions, as you probably will in many instances, acquire these facts or secure the information you need quietly without disclosing your purpose. 56 Who Risk the Gallows The greatest decision of all time, as far as any American citizen is concerned, was reached in Philadelphia July 4, 1776, when 56 men signed their names to a document which they well knew would bring freedom to all Americans or leave every one of the 56 hanging from a gallows. You have heard of this famous document, but you may not have drawn from it the great lesson in personal achievement it so plainly taught. We all remember the date of this momentous decision, but few of us realize what courage that decision required. We remember our history as it was taught. We remember dates and the names of the men who fought. We remember Valley Forge and Yorktown. We remember George Washington and Lord Cornwallis. But we know little of the real forces back of these names, dates, and places. We know still less of that intangible power which ensured us freedom long before Washington's armies reached Yorktown. It is nothing short of tragedy that the writers of history have missed entirely even the slightest reference to the irresistible power which gave birth and freedom to the nation destined to set up new standards of independence for all the peoples of the earth. I say it as a tragedy because it is the selfsame power which must be used by every individual who surmounts the difficulties of life and forces life to pay the price asked. Analyze the events which led to the Declaration of Independence and be convinced that this nation, which now holds a position of commanding respect and power among all nations of the world, 
was born of a decision created by a master mind consisting of fifty-six men. Note well the fact that it was their decision which ensured the success of Washington's armies, because the spirit of that decision was in the heart of every soldier who fought with him, and served as a spiritual power which recognizes no such thing as failure. Note also, with great personal benefit, that the power which gave this nation its freedom is the self-same power that must be used by every individual who becomes self-determining. This power is made up of the principles described in this book. It will not be difficult to detect in the story of the Declaration of Independence at least six of these principles. Desire, decision, faith, persistence, the mastermind, and organized planning. Know what you want, and you'll generally get it. Throughout this philosophy will be found the suggestion that thought, backed by strong desire, has a tendency to transmute itself into its physical equivalent. In your search for the secret of the method, do not look for a miracle, because you will not find it. You will find only the eternal laws of nature. These laws are available to every person who has the faith and the courage to use them. They may be used to bring freedom to a nation, or to accumulate riches. Definiteness of decision always requires courage, sometimes very great courage. The fifty-six men who signed the Declaration of Independence staked their lives on the decision to affix their signatures to that document. The person who reaches a definite decision to procure the particular job and make life pay the price he asks does not stake his life on that decision. He stakes his economic freedom. Financial independence, riches, desirable business, and professional positions are not within reach of the person who neglects or refuses to expect, plan, and demand these things. The person who desires riches in the same spirit that Samuel Adams desired freedom for the colonies is sure to accumulate wealth. Persistence the sustained effort necessary to induce faith. The eighth step toward riches. Persistence is an essential factor in the procedure of transmuting desire into its monetary equivalent. The basis of persistence is the power of will. Willpower and desire, when properly combined, make an irresistible pair. The starting point of all achievement is desire. Keep this constantly in mind. Weak desires bring weak results just as a small amount of fire makes a small amount of heat. If you find yourself lacking in persistence, this weakness may be remedied by building a stronger fire under your desires. And if you find that you are indifferent, you may be sure that you have not yet acquired the money consciousness which you must possess before you can be sure of accumulating a fortune. Those who can take it are bountifully rewarded for their persistence. They receive as their compensation whatever goal they are pursuing. That is not all. They receive something infinitely more important than material compensation, the knowledge that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. You can train yourself to be persistent. Persistence is a state of mind. Therefore, it can be cultivated. Like all states of mind, persistence is based upon definite causes. Among them these, A, definiteness of purpose. Knowing what one wants is the first and perhaps the most important step toward the development of persistence. A strong motive forces one to surmount many difficulties. B, desire. It is comparatively easy to acquire and to maintain persistence in pursuing the object of intense desire. C, self-reliance. Belief in one's ability to carry out a plan encourages one to follow the plan through with persistence. Self-reliance can be developed through the principle described in the chapter on auto-suggestion. D. Definiteness of plans. Organized plans, even though they may be weak and entirely impractical, encourage persistence. E. Accurate knowledge. Knowing that one's plans are sound, based upon experience or observation, encourages persistence. Guessing instead of knowing destroys persistence. F. Cooperation. Sympathy, understanding, and harmonious cooperation with others 
tend to develop persistence. G. Willpower. The habit of concentrating one's thoughts upon the building of plans for the attainment of a definite purpose leads to persistence. H. Habit. Persistence is the direct result of habit. The mind absorbs and becomes a part of the daily experiences upon which it feeds. Fear, the worst of all enemies, can be effectively cured by forced repetition of acts of courage. Everyone who has seen active service in war knows this. Take your own persistence inventory. Before leaving the subject of persistence, take inventory of yourself and determine in what particular, if any, you are lacking in this essential quality. Measure yourself courageously, point by point, and see how many of the eight factors of persistence you lack. The analysis may lead to discoveries that will give you a new grip on yourself. If you fear criticism, let us examine some of the symptoms of the fear of criticism. The majority of people permit relatives, friends, and the public at large to so influence them that they cannot live their own lives because they fear criticism. Huge numbers of people make mistakes in marriage, stand by the bargain, and go through life miserable and unhappy because they fear criticism which may follow if they correct the mistake. Anyone who has submitted to this form of fear knows the irreparable damage it does by destroying one's ambition and the desire to achieve. Millions of people neglect to acquire belated educations after having left school because they fear criticism. Countless numbers of men and women, both young and old, permit relatives to wreck their lives in the name of duty because they fear criticism. Duty does not require any person to submit to the destruction of his personal ambitions and the right to live his own life in his own way. People refuse to take chances in business because they fear the criticism which may follow if they fail. The fear of criticism in such cases is stronger than the desire for success. How to develop persistence? There are four simple steps which lead to the habit of persistence. They call for no great amount of intelligence, no particular amount of education, and but little time or effort. The necessary steps are, one, a definite purpose backed by burning desire for its fulfillment. Two, a definite plan expressed in continuous action. Three, a mind closed tightly against all negative and discouraging influences, including negative suggestions of relatives, friends, and acquaintances. Four, a friendly alliance with one or more persons who will encourage one to follow through with both plan and purpose. These four steps are essential for success in all walks of life. The entire purpose of the thirteen principles of this philosophy is to enable one to take these four steps as a matter of habit. These are the steps by which one may control one's economic destiny. They are the steps that lead to freedom and independence of thought. They are the steps that lead to riches in small or great quantities. They lead the way to power, fame, and worldly recognition. They are the four steps which guarantee favorable breaks. They are the steps that convert dreams into physical realities. They lead also to the mastery of fear, discouragement, and indifference. There is a magnificent reward for all who learn to take these four steps. It is the privilege of writing one's own ticket and of making life yield whatever price is asked. How to Master Difficulties What mystical power gives to men of persistence the capacity to master difficulties? Does the quality of persistence set up in one's mind some form of spiritual, mental, or chemical activity which gives one access to supernatural forces? Does infinite intelligence throw itself on the side of the person who still fights on after the battle has been lost? with the whole world on the opposing side? You may be interested in knowing that I had the help of some 500 of the most successful men in America to help me create the science of personal achievement. Uh, among them were such men as Thomas A. Edison, Henry Ford, John Wanamaker. Uh, let me tell you about one man, perhaps my most outstanding student, who has made a tremendous success of his life by applying definite as a purpose. His name is W. Clement Stone, president of the Combined Insurance Company of America. Right after Think and Grow Rich was published in 1937, someone gave Mr. Stone a copy of this book, and he was so impressed by it 
that he laid out a 20-year plan for himself. At that time, he was selling insurance, I suppose making two or three, maybe $400 a week at the most. Now, his plan called for him to own a company of his own within 20 years and for him to be president of it and his uh, personal fortune to be not less than 10 millions of dollars. Well, long before the 20 years were up, he was the president and majority owner of four large insurance companies. His personal fortune was over 35 millions of dollars. And today, it is estimated that his fortune is over 100 million dollars. And he attributes his success entirely to the application of the famous Andrew Carnegie philosophy, and particularly to the application of definiteness of purpose. His 2,000 salesmen are known to be the most successful men in the insurance field, and every one of those 2,000 men has been taught to use the science of personal achievement and to emphasize the principle of definiteness of purpose. Power of the Mastermind the driving force, the ninth step toward riches. Power is essential for success in the accumulation of money. Plans are inert and useless without sufficient power to translate them into action. This chapter will describe the method by which an individual may attain and apply power. Power may be defined as organized and intelligently directed knowledge. Power, as the term is here used, refers to organized effort, sufficient to enable an individual to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent. Organized effort is produced through the coordination of effort of two or more people who work toward a definite end in a spirit of harmony. Power is required for the accumulation of money. Power is necessary for the retention of money after it has been accumulated. Let us ascertain how power may be acquired. If power is organized knowledge, let us examine the sources of knowledge. A. Infinite intelligence. This source of knowledge may be contacted through the procedure described in another chapter with the aid of creative imagination. B. Accumulated experience. The accumulated experience of man, or that portion of it which has been organized and recorded, may be found in any well-equipped public library. An important part of this accumulated experience is taught in public schools and colleges where it has been classified and organized. C. Experiment and research. In the field of science, and in practically every other walk of life, men are gathering, classifying, and organizing new facts daily. This is the source to which one must turn when knowledge is not available through accumulated experience. Here, too, the creative imagination must often be used. Knowledge may be required from any of the foregoing sources. It may be converted into power by organizing it into definite plans and by expressing those plans in terms of action. Gaining power through the mastermind. The mastermind may be defined as coordination of knowledge and effort in a spirit of harmony between two or more people for the attainment of a definite purpose. No individual may have great power without availing himself of the mastermind. In a preceding chapter, instructions were given for the creation of plans for the purpose of translating desire into its monetary equivalent. If you carry out these instructions with persistence and intelligence and use discrimination in the selection of your mastermind group, your objective will have been halfway reached even before you begin to recognize it. So you may better understand the intangible potentialities of power available to you through a properly chosen mastermind group. We will here explain the two characteristics of the mastermind principle, one of which is economic in nature and the other psychic. The economic feature is obvious. Economic advantages may be created by any person who surrounds himself with the advice, counsel, and personal cooperation of a group of men who are willing to lend him wholehearted aid in a spirit of perfect harmony. This form of cooperative alliance has been the basis of nearly every great fortune. Your understanding of this great truth may definitely determine your financial status. The psychic phase of the mastermind principle is much more difficult to comprehend. You may catch a significant suggestion from this statement. 
no two minds ever come together without thereby creating a third invisible intangible force which may be likened to a third mind. How to multiply your brain power. Man's brain may be compared to an electric battery. It is a well-known fact that a group of electric batteries will provide more energy than a single battery. It is also a well-known fact that an individual battery will provide energy in proportion to the number and capacity of the cells it contains. The brain functions in a similar fashion. This accounts for the fact that some brains are more efficient than others and leads to this significant statement. A group of brains, coordinated or connected in a spirit of harmony, will provide more thought energy than a single brain, just as a group of electric batteries will provide more energy than a single battery. Through this metaphor, it becomes immediately obvious that the mastermind principle holds the secret of the power wielded by men who surround themselves with other men of brains. There follows now another statement which will lead still nearer to an understanding of the psychic phase of the mastermind principle. When a group of individual brains are coordinated and function in harmony, the increased energy created through that alliance becomes available to every individual brain in the group. It is a well-known fact that Henry Ford began his business career under the handicap of poverty, illiteracy, and ignorance. It is an equally well-known fact that within the inconceivably short period of ten years, Mr. Ford mastered these three handicaps, and that within twenty-five years, he made himself one of the richest men in America. Connect with this fact the additional knowledge that Mr. Ford's most rapid strides became noticeable from the time he became a personal friend of Thomas A. Edison, and you will begin to understand what the influence of one mind upon another can accomplish. Go a step farther and consider the fact that Mr. Ford's most outstanding achievements began from the time that he formed the acquaintance of Harvey Firestone, John Burroughs, and Luther Burbank, each a man of great brain capacity. And you will have further evidence that power may be produced through friendly alliance of minds. Let me tell you about my experience in helping Franklin D. Roosevelt to create a mastermind which broke the back of the Depression in 1933. Shortly after the president entered the White House, he sent for me to come and go to work for him. We created one of the most outstanding masterminds that this nation has ever known, perhaps. It consisted of both houses of Congress working in harmony with the president something that never had been done before and never has been done since, probably to the extent that we accomplished it there in 1933. The majority of the newspaper publishers of America, regardless of their political leanings, practically every one of them got behind the president as a result of this mastermind operation which we set up at the White House. And the radio station operators, without any reference whatsoever to their political leanings. They got behind the president and they used uh, the material which I prepared to send out to go over the air. In other words, material that uh, we used to sell the good features of the United States instead of dwelling upon the bad ones. And then the churches of all denominations, I have never seen such a job as they did. The priests and the clergymen of all denominations went into their pulpits and they did a wonderful job of selling uh, the United States of America to the people. Then the leaders of both the major political parties, they crossed party lines. There were no Democrats and no Republicans, no anything else in Congress. They were nothing but Americans uh, helping the President of the United States to bring this country out of chaos. And then most of all, there was a majority of the American people of all political and religious leanings. I have never seen the people of the United States get behind a President so squarely as they did uh, behind FDR in those perilous days of 1933. Now here was a mastermind alliance that served a great purpose at a time of need. And uh, I hope to see the time come when I may contribute my services in building a mastermind alliance that will permanently serve the President of the United States as it did in 1933. The Mystery of Sex Transmutation The Tenth Step Toward Riches the meaning of the word transmute is, in simple language, the changing or transferring of one element or form of energy into another. The ten stimuli of the mind. The human mind responds to stimuli through which it may be keyed up 
to high rates of vibration, known as enthusiasm, creative imagination, intense desire, and so on. The stimuli to which the mind responds most freely are, one, the desire for sex expression, two, love, three, a burning desire for fame, power, or financial gain, money. Four, music. Five, friendship between either those of the same sex or those of the opposite sex. Six, a mastermind alliance based upon the harmony of two or more people who ally themselves for spiritual or temporal advancement. Seven, mutual suffering, such as that experienced by people who are persecuted. Eight, auto-suggestion, nine, fear, ten, narcotics and alcohol. The desire for sex expression comes at the head of the list of stimuli, which most effectively step up the mind and start the wheels of physical action. Eight of these stimuli are natural and constructive. Two are destructive. When brain action has been stimulated through one or more of the ten mind stimulants, it has the effect of lifting the individual far above the horizon of ordinary thought and permits him to envision distance, scope, and quality of thoughts not available on the lower plane, such as that occupied while one is engaged in the solution of the problems of business and professional routine. The world is ruled and the destiny of civilization is established by the human emotions. People are influenced in their actions not by reason so much as by feelings. The creative faculty of the mind is set into action entirely by emotions and not by cold reason. The most powerful of all human emotions is that of sex. There are other mind stimulants, some of which have been listed, but no one of them, nor all of them combined, can equal the driving power of sex. A mind stimulant is any influence which will either temporarily or permanently increase the intensity of thought. The ten major stimulants described are those most commonly resorted to. Through these sources, one may commune with infinite intelligence or enter at will the storehouse of the subconscious mind, either one's own or that of another person, a procedure which is all there is of genius. The emotion of sex is an irresistible force against which there can be no such opposition as an immovable body. When driven by this emotion, men become gifted with a superpower for action. Understand this truth and you will catch the significance of the statement that sex transmutation contains the secret of creative ability. The transmutation of sex energy calls for the exercise of willpower, to be sure, but the reward is worth the effort. The desire for sexual expression is inborn and natural. The desire cannot and should not be submerged or eliminated, but it should be given an outlet through forms of expression which enrich the body, mind, and spirit of man. Sex alone is a mighty urge to action. But its forces are like a cyclone. They are often uncontrollable. When the emotion of love begins to mix itself with the emotion of sex, the result is calmness of purpose, poise, accuracy of judgment, and balance. Love is, without question, life's greatest experience. It brings one into communion with infinite intelligence. When mixed with the emotions of romance and sex, it may lead one far up the ladder of creative effort. The emotions of love, sex, and romance are sides of the eternal triangle of achievement-building genius. Love is an emotion with many sides, shades, and colors. But the most intense and burning of all kinds of love is that experienced in the blending of the emotions of love and sex. When the emotion of romance is added to those of love and sex, the obstructions between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence are removed. Then a genius has been born. The Subconscious Mind The Connecting Link The Eleventh Step Toward Riches The subconscious mind consists of a field of consciousness in which every impulse of thought that reaches the conscious mind through any of the five senses is classified and recorded, and from which thoughts may be recalled or withdrawn as letters may be taken from a filing cabinet. It receives and files sense impressions or thoughts, regardless of their nature. You may voluntarily plant in your subconscious mind any plan, thought, or purpose which you desire to translate into its physical or monetary equivalent. 
The subconscious acts first on the dominating desires which have been mixed with emotional feelings, such as faith. You cannot entirely control your subconscious mind, but you can voluntarily hand over to it any plan, desire, or purpose which you wish transformed into concrete form. After you have accepted as a reality the existence of the subconscious mind and understand its possibilities as a medium for transmuting your desires into their physical or monetary equivalent, you will comprehend the full significance of the instructions given in the chapter on desire. You will also understand why you have been repeatedly admonished to make your desires clear and to reduce them to writing. You will also understand the necessity of persistence in carrying out instructions. The thirteen principles are the stimuli with which you acquire the ability to reach and to influence your subconscious mind. Do not become discouraged if you cannot do this upon the first attempt. Remember that the subconscious mind may be voluntarily directed only through habit under the directions given in the chapter on faith. You have not yet had time to master faith. Be patient. Be persistent. Please fast forward to the end and turn the tape over for proper cueing of side four. All thought impulses intended for transmutation into their physical equivalent, voluntarily planted in the subconscious mind, must pass through the imagination and be mixed with faith. The mixing of faith with a plan or purpose intended for submission to the subconscious mind may be done only through the imagination. From these statements, you will readily observe that voluntary use of the subconscious mind calls for coordination and application of all the principles. You are preparing yourself to influence and control the inner audience of your subconscious mind in order to hand over to it the desire for money, which you wish transmuted into its monetary equivalent. It is essential, therefore, that you understand the method of approach to this inner audience. You must speak its language or it will not heed your call. It understands best the language of emotion or feeling. Let us therefore describe here the seven major positive emotions and the seven major negative emotions, so that you may draw upon the positives and avoid the negatives when giving instructions to your subconscious mind. The seven major positive emotions, the emotion of desire, the emotion of faith, the emotion of love, the emotion of sex, the emotion of enthusiasm, the emotion of romance, the emotion of hope. There are other positive emotions, but these are the seven most powerful and the ones most commonly used in creative effort. Master these seven emotions. They can be mastered only by use, and the other positive emotions will be at your command when you need them. Remember in this connection that you are studying a book which is intended to help you develop a money consciousness by filling your mind with positive emotions. The seven major negative emotions to be avoided the emotion of fear, the emotion of jealousy, the emotion of hatred, the emotion of revenge, the emotion of greed, the emotion of superstition, the emotion of anger. Positive and negative emotions cannot occupy the mind at the same time. One or the other must dominate. It is your responsibility to make sure that positive emotions constitute the dominating influence of your mind. Here the law of habit will come to your aid. Form the habit of applying and using the positive emotions. Eventually they will dominate your mind so completely that the negatives cannot enter it. Only by following these instructions literally and continuously can you gain control over your subconscious mind. The presence of a single negative in your conscious mind is sufficient to destroy all chances of constructive aid from your subconscious mind. The Brain, a broadcasting and receiving station for thought, the twelfth step toward riches. 
More than 40 years ago, the author, working in conjunction with the late Dr. Alexander Graham Bell and Dr. Elmer R. Gates, observed that every human brain is both a broadcasting and receiving station for the vibration of thought. The subconscious mind is the sending station of the brain, through which vibrations of thought are broadcast. The creative imagination is the receiving set, through which the energies of thought are picked up. Along with the important factors of the subconscious mind and the faculty of the creative imagination, which constitute the sending and receiving sets of your mental broadcasting machinery, consider now the principle of auto-suggestion, which is the medium by which you may put into operation your broadcasting station. Through the instructions described in the chapter on auto-suggestion, you were definitely informed of the method by which desire may be transmuted into its monetary equivalent. Operation of your mental broadcasting station is a comparatively simple procedure. You have but three principles to bear in mind and to apply when you wish to use your broadcasting station. The subconscious mind, creative imagination, and auto-suggestion. The stimuli through which you put these three principles into action have been described, and the procedure begins with desire. The greatest forces are intangible. Through the ages which have passed, man has depended too much upon his physical senses and has limited his knowledge to physical things, which he could see, touch, weigh, and measure. We are now entering the most marvelous of all ages, an age which will teach us something of the intangible forces of the world about us. Perhaps we shall learn, as we pass through this age, that the other self is more powerful than the physical self we see when we look into a mirror. Sometimes men speak lightly of the intangibles, the things which they cannot perceive through any of their five senses, and when we hear them, it should remind us that all of us are controlled by forces which are unseen and intangible. The whole of mankind has not the power to cope with nor to control the intangible force wrapped up in the rolling waves of the ocean. Man has not the capacity to understand the intangible force of gravity, which keeps this little earth suspended in space, and keeps man from falling from it, much less the power to control that force. Man is entirely subservient to the intangible force which comes with a thunderstorm, and he is just as helpless in the presence of the intangible force of electricity. Nor is this by any means the end of man's ignorance in connection with things unseen and intangible. He does not understand the intangible force and intelligence wrapped up in the soil of the earth, the force which provides him with every morsel of food he eats, every article of clothing he wears, every dollar he carries in his pockets. The power of thought is the only thing over which you have complete, unchallenged, and unchallengeable control, controlled by power of will. In given human beings control over but one thing, the Creator must have chosen the most important of all things. Uh, this is a stupendous fact that merits your most profound consideration. If you give it this sort of consideration, you will discover for yourself the rich promises available to those who become masters of their own mind power through self-discipline. The Sixth Sense The Door to the Temple of Wisdom The Thirteenth Step Toward Riches The Thirteenth Principle is known as the Sixth Sense, through which infinite intelligence may and will communicate voluntarily without any effort from or demands by the individual. This principle is the apex of the philosophy. It can be assimilated, understood, and applied only by first mastering the other twelve principles. The sixth sense is that portion of the subconscious mind which has been referred to as the creative imagination. It has also been referred to as the receiving set through which ideas, plans, and thoughts flash into the mind. The flashes are sometimes called hunches or inspiration. The sixth sense defies description. It cannot be described to a person who has not mastered the other principles of this philosophy because such a person has no knowledge and no experience with which the sixth sense may be compared. Miracles of the Sixth Sense The author is not a believer in nor the advocate of miracles for the reason that he has enough knowledge of nature to understand that nature never deviates from her established laws. Some of her laws are so incomprehensible that they produce what appear to be miracles. 
The sixth sense comes as near to being a miracle as anything I have ever experienced. This much the author does know, that there is a power or a first cause or an intelligence which permeates every atom of matter and embraces every unit of energy perceptible to man, that this infinite intelligence converts acorns into oak trees, causes water to flow downhill in response to the law of gravity, follows night with day and winter with summer, each maintaining its proper place and relationship to the other. This intelligence may, through the principles of this philosophy, be induced to aid in transmuting desires into concrete or material form. The author has this knowledge because he has experimented with it and has experienced it. Step by step through the preceding chapters, you have been led to this, the last principle. If you have mastered each of the preceding principles, you are now prepared to accept, without being skeptical, the stupendous claims made here. If you have not mastered the other principles, you must do so before you may determine definitely whether or not the claims made in this chapter are fact or fiction. Long before I had ever written a line for publication or endeavored to deliver a speech in public, I followed the habit of reshaping my own character by trying to imitate the nine men whose lives and works had been most impressive to me. These nine men were Emerson, Paine, Edison, Darwin, Lincoln, Burbank, Napoleon, Ford, and Carnegie. Every night, over a long period of years, I held an imaginary council meeting with this group whom I called my invisible counselors. I had a very definite purpose in indulging my imagination through these nightly meetings. My purpose was to rebuild my own character so it would represent a composite of the characters of my imaginary counselors. Realizing, as I did early in life, that I had to overcome the handicap of birth in an environment of ignorance and superstition, I deliberately assigned myself the task of voluntary rebirth through the method I have described above. Building Character Through Autosuggestion I knew, of course, that all men have become what they are because of their dominating thoughts and desires. I knew that every deeply seated desire has the effect of causing one to seek outward expression through which that desire may be transmuted into reality. I knew that self-suggestion is a powerful factor in building character, that it is, in fact, the sole principle through which character is built. With this knowledge of the principles of mind operation, I was fairly well armed with the equipment needed in rebuilding my character. In these imaginary council meetings, I called on my cabinet members for the knowledge I wished each to contribute. My method of addressing the members of the imaginary cabinet would vary according to the traits of character in which I was, for the moment, most interested in acquiring. I studied the records of their lives with painstaking care. After some months of this nightly procedure, I was astounded by the discovery that these imaginary figures became apparently real. Each of these nine men developed individual characteristics which surprised me. For example, Lincoln developed the habit of always being late, and then walking around in solemn parade. He always wore an expression of seriousness upon his face. Rarely did I see him smile. That was not true of the others. Burbank and Payne often indulged in witty repartee, which seemed at times to shock the other members of the cabinet. These meetings became so realistic that I became fearful of their consequences and discontinued them for several months. The experiences were so uncanny, I was afraid if I continued them, I would lose sight of the fact that the meetings were purely experiences of my imagination. This is the first time that I have had the courage to mention this. Heretofore, I have remained quiet on the subject, because I knew from my own attitude and connection with such matters that I would be misunderstood if I described my unusual experience. I have been emboldened now to reduce my experience to the printed page because I am now less concerned about what they say than I was in the years that have passed. Lest I be misunderstood, I wish here to state most emphatically that I still regard my cabinet meetings as being purely imaginary, but I feel entitled to suggest that while the members of my cabinet may be purely fictional and the meetings existent only in my own imagination, they have led me into glorious paths of adventure, rekindled an appreciation of true greatness, encouraged creative endeavor, and emboldened the expression of honest thought. Tapping the Source of Inspiration 
Somewhere in the cell structure of the brain is located an organ which receives vibrations of thought ordinarily called hunches. So far, science has not discovered where this organ of the sixth sense is located, but this is not important. The fact remains that human beings do receive accurate knowledge through sources other than the physical senses. Such knowledge generally is received when the mind is under the influence of extraordinary stimulation. Any emergency which arouses the emotions and causes the heart to beat more rapidly than normal may, and generally does, bring the sixth sense into action. Anyone who has experienced a near accident while driving knows that on such occasions the sixth sense often comes to one's rescue and aids by split seconds in avoiding the accident. My original purpose in conducting council meetings with imaginary beings was solely that of impressing my own subconscious mind through the principle of auto-suggestion with certain characteristics which I desired to acquire. In more recent years, my experimentation has taken on an entirely different trend. I now go to my imaginary counselors with every difficult problem which confronts me and my clients. The results are often astonishing, although I do not depend entirely on this form of counsel. The starting point of all achievement is desire. The finishing point is that brand of knowledge which leads to understanding, understanding of self, understanding of others, understanding of the laws of nature, recognition and understanding of happiness. This sort of understanding comes in its fullness only through familiarity with and use of the principle of the sixth sense. Before you can put any portion of this philosophy into successful use, your mind must be prepared to receive it. The preparation is not difficult. It begins with study, analysis, and understanding of three enemies which you shall have to clear out, indecision, doubt, and fear. The sixth sense will never function while these three negatives, or any one of them, remain in your mind. The members of this unholy trio are closely related. Where one is found, the other two are close at hand. The Six Basic Fears There are six basic fears, with some combination of which every human suffers at one time or another. Most people are fortunate if they do not suffer from the entire six. Named in the order of their most common appearance, they are the fear of poverty, the fear of criticism, the fear of ill health. That's at the bottom of most of one's worries. The fear of loss of love of someone, the fear of old age, the fear of death. All other fears are of minor importance. They can be grouped under these six headings. Fears are nothing more than states of mind. One state of mind is subject to control and direction. Man can create nothing which he does not first conceive in the form of an impulse of thought. Following this statement comes another of still greater importance. Namely, man's thought impulses begin immediately to translate themselves into their physical equivalent, whether those thoughts are voluntary or involuntary. Thought impulses which are picked up by mere chance, thoughts which have been released by other minds, may determine one's financial, business, professional, or social destiny just as surely as do the thought impulses which one creates by intent and design. We are here laying the foundation for the presentation of a fact of great importance to the person who does not understand why some people appear to be lucky, while others of equal or greater ability, training, experience, and brain capacity seem destined to ride with misfortune. This fact may be explained by the statement that every human being has the ability to completely control his own mind. And with this control, obviously, every person may open his mind to the tramp thought impulses which are being released by other brains, or close the doors tightly and admit only thought impulses of his own choice. Nature has endowed man with absolute control over but one thing, and that is thought. This fact coupled with the additional fact that everything which man creates begins in the form of a thought, leads one very near to the principle by which fear may be mastered. If it is true that all thought has a tendency to clothe itself in its physical equivalent, and this is true beyond any reasonable room for doubt, it is equally true that thought impulses of fear and poverty cannot be translated into terms of courage and financial gain. The six basic fears become translated into a state of worry through indecision. 
relieve yourself forever of the fear of death by reaching a decision to accept death as an inescapable event. Whip the fear of poverty by reaching a decision to get along with whatever wealth you can accumulate without worry. Put your foot upon the neck of fear of criticism by reaching a decision not to worry about what other people think, do, or say. Eliminate the fear of old age by reaching a decision to accept it, not as a handicap, but as a great blessing which carries with it wisdom, self-control, and understanding not known to you. Acquit yourself of the fear of ill health by the decision to forget symptoms. Master the fear of loss of love by reaching a decision to get along without love if that is necessary. Kill the habit of worry in all its forms by reaching a general blanket decision that nothing which life has to offer is worth the price of worry. With this decision will come poise, peace of mind, and calmness of thought, which will bring happiness. A man whose mind is filled with fear not only destroys his own chances of intelligent action, but he transmits these destructive vibrations to the minds of all who come into contact with him and also destroys their chances. The Devil's Workshop in addition to the six basic fears, there is another evil by which people suffer. It constitutes a rich soil in which the seeds of failure grow abundantly. It is so subtle that its presence often is not detected. This affliction cannot properly be classed as a fear. It is more deeply seated and more often fatal than all of the six fears. For want of a better name, let us call this evil susceptibility to negative influences. Men who accumulate great riches always protect themselves against this evil. The poverty-stricken never do. Those who succeed in any calling must prepare their minds to resist the evil. If you are reading this philosophy for the purpose of accumulating riches, you should examine yourself very carefully to determine whether you are susceptible to negative influences. If you neglect this self-analysis, you will forfeit your right to attain the object of your desires. How to Protect Yourself Against Negative Influences To protect yourself against negative influences, whether of your own making or the result of the activities of negative people around you, recognize that you have a willpower and put it into constant use until it builds a wall of immunity against negative influences in your own mind. Recognize the fact that you and every other human being are by nature lazy, indifferent, and susceptible to all suggestions which harmonize with your weaknesses. Recognize that you are by nature susceptible to all the six basic fears, and set up habits for the purpose of counteracting all those fears. Recognize that negative influences often work on you through your subconscious mind. Therefore, they are difficult to detect, and keep your mind closed against all people who depress or discourage you in any way. Clean out your medicine chest, throw away all pill bottles, and stop pandering to colds, aches, pains, and imaginary illness. Deliberately seek the company of people who influence you to think and act for yourself. Do not expect troubles, as they have a tendency not to disappoint. Without doubt, the most common weakness of all human beings is the habit of leaving their minds open to the negative influence of other people. This weakness is all the more damaging because most people do not recognize that they are cursed by it, and many who acknowledge it neglect or refuse to correct the evil until it becomes an uncontrollable part of their daily habits. In parting, I would remind you that life is a checkerboard, and the player opposite you is time. If you hesitate before moving or neglect to move promptly, your men will be wiped off the board by time. You are playing against a partner who will not tolerate indecision. Previously, you may have had a logical excuse for not having forced life to come through with whatever you asked, but that alibi is now obsolete because you are in possession of the master key that unlocks the door to life's bountiful riches. The master key is intangible, but it is powerful. It is the privilege of creating in your own mind a burning desire for a definite form of riches. There is no penalty for the use of the key, but there is a price you must pay if you do not use it. The price is failure. There is a reward of stupendous proportions if you put the key to use. It is the satisfaction that comes to all who conquer self and force life to pay whatever is asked. It has been said that I have made more successful men than any man living today. I don't know whether that's true or not. 
because there's no way of getting accurate statistics. But ladies and gentlemen, when I, when I take inventory of the people that I do know who started at scratch and have become millionaires, and some of them not quite that much money, but become profoundly uh, successful, I recognize that I have created a philosophy here through the good work of Mr. Carnegie that's been a benefactor to the world, not only to those who are living now, but to those who are not yet born. When Mr. Carnegie sold me on the organizing this philosophy, he said, I'm going to give away my money before I die as fast as I can find ways and means of giving it away without doing damage. And as you, of course, know, he did just that. He gave it away for educational purposes, libraries, foundations for the maintenance of peace, and in every way that he could conceive. But he said, by far the greatest part of my riches I am entrusting to you to take to the people of the world in the form of the know-how through which I gain my money. And he said, if you carry through the trust and perfect your job, as I sincerely believe you will, you'll live to see the time when you're far and away richer than I am and when you will have made many more successful men than I have ever made. And ladies and gentlemen, when Mr. Carnegie made that statement, it was just too much for me to swallow. I, I thought, well, Mr. Carnegie has never flattered me before. He's never said anything that didn't turn out to be right. But that's just one of those things that never could happen. I have already made thousands of times more successful men than Mr. Carnegie ever had. Thousands of times. And I'm still in the process of making. You know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, during those 20 years of research that I put into the building of this philosophy, I ran into some very profound facts and truths. And one of them consists in this fact, that when a great crisis comes over the world, there always comes out some unknown with the formula for dissolving that crisis. Like Abraham Lincoln, for instance, in the time of need, when this country was about to be split asunder by internal strife. By George Washington, preceding Lincoln. By Franklin D. Roosevelt at the time when the people were stampeded with fear and they were standing in great lines to draw their money out of the bank. And I sometimes wonder if this hand of destiny, which has such a long arm behind it, doesn't reach over in places like the one where I was born and lift out people out of humble and lowly stations and give them great jobs to do in life as an inspiration and an object lesson to other people to show what can be done when one recognizes the God-given power of thought and puts it to proper use. Because if you really and truly tune in on the main line of my source of faith and my source of enthusiasm, become indoctrinated with this philosophy, no matter what it is that you're doing in life, what it is you want to do, you'll find a way always open, and I thank you very much. Thank you.